last year I gave a talk about Nobel Prize in physics and this year I had again a pleasure to give a talk because it's clearly related to uh, astrophysics and uh, astronomy. And in the background here, you would wonder why I'm showing this picture. It's the most famous picture of M87, the black hole shadow or silhouette more correctly. Well, uh, I think that the Nobel Prize Committee was considerably uh, under the impression of, of this first image of the black hole. And then I think they, they decided, well, black holes do exist. And then let's, let's look who, who contributed to the proof of their existence in a most considerable way in the past. And here we have uh, this year laureates. So according to official announcement, the Nobel Prize in Physics 2020 was divided. One half awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. And the other half jointly to Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ges for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So here you see the photos of our laureates. And note two things. First, about the Roger Penrose. His fantastic and critical contribution to the black hole physics was done in 1965, so many, many years ago. On the other hand, notice also in the second part of this announcement that the award is not for black hole, but for a supermassive compact object. That shows that somehow black holes still are having difficulties to get through. So let's start with Roger Penrose because his paper is absolutely critical for black hole studies. And let's start with, with some background. So the paper was published in year 1965. And only two years before, in 1963, the nature of quasars was revealed. And quasars appeared to be compact, extremely luminous sources at, galact at cosmological distances. And one year later, already it was proposed independently by Sal, Peter and Zeldovich that the only reasonable way to power quasars is through accretion onto a supermassive black hole. So black holes were born, I mean, conceptually. And then let's, let's have a look how uh, the, this identification of, of uh, quasars as with, with black holes uh, happened. If first, after the Second World War, radio astronomy developed and soon later several radio galaxies were discovered and at the same time uh, observers discovered point-like sources, strong radio uh, emitting point-like sources of unspecified uh, nature. They looked like stars, so this is quasi-stellar sources, quasars later for short. And only Martin, uh, uh, Martin Schmidt, when he was looking at the spectrum of a quasar, the most famous quasar, CC 273, he realized that mysterious lines, emission lines, which did not seem to fit anything, are just hydrogen emission lines, Barmer line series, only it's shifted. And if it is shifted considerably, then using a Hubble law, 
now named officially by the, uh, by the way, hubble lemaitre law, it was possible to determine the, the, the cosmological uh, 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 distance. And that created immediately a problem, how to explain those sources. Because as we read already in the original paper by Martin Schmidt in 1963, the stellar object is a nuclear region of a galaxy with cosmological redshift of 0.158. The distance is not so important, but the diameter of the nuclear region would have to be less than one kiloparsec. That means less than 10% of the normal size of a galaxy. This nuclear region, on the other hand, would be about 100 times brighter optically than any of the luminous galaxies. And the total energy radiating in the optical range at, at constant luminosity would be, would be of an order of 10 to 59 ergs. So there was a question of the source of the, of, of the energy because stars were unable to produce this kind of, of luminosity. And this is why black holes and accretion were, was suggested as, as, as the solution because Accretion onto a black hole is the most efficient energetically process in, in astrophysics. And that clearly inspired Roger Perlows in his thinking about gravitational collapse. Because if we, if we look at the beginning of his paper, sent already in 64, published in 65, this is how the paper starts. The discovery of the quasi-stellar radio sources has stimulated renewed interest in the question of gravitational collapse. It has been suggested by some authors that the enormous amount of energy that these objects apparently emit may result from the collapse of a mass of the order of 10 to 6, 10 to 8 solar masses to the neighborhood of its Schwarzschild radius. And at that time, uh, really discussion started because black hole, as we know, consists of a horizon, but then also of the, of the central point-like singularity. And this point-like singularity is, is, a, is the heart of the black hole. And it was really quite difficult to imagine how we can squeeze the huge, mm -mm, extended amount of, of gaseous material into a point like source. That seemed improbable. So when people imagined a purely spherical collapse, then of course, in the case of purely spherical collapse, you can squeeze the matter into really a point at the very center of the dis distribution. On the other hand, if you have some irregularities or departure of, of, uh, from uh, spherical symmetry, then the argument was, well, let's say some part of the material will arrive earlier and some part will arrive later and then this material will overshoot or will have some angular momentum or whatever reason, it will not reach the center, the point-like singularity at the requested time, and then perhaps a, a black holes cannot form in practice, and if they cannot form through collapse, then there is no point to, 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 to postulate. And here, the, the, the paper by Roger Penrose comes. I'm not going to discuss about uh, how he, he, he proved his uh, statement because this is mathematically very complicated and I do not really feel an expert in this field. But what is really important is, is kind of intuitive. He considered how the collapse of the material should happen, starting from the beginning, from the distribution of 
of material, he first looked at uh, really spherically symmetric uh, collapse, but later he showed that uh, this is not really important for the rest of the of the arguments. Excuse me. <clears throat> But during the collapse, if you really approach the, the, the size, more or less of the size of the to be horizon, you form something like trapped surface. So material starts to head towards the center, a trapped surface forms a space-like two-dimensional surface and if the material finds inside this trapped surface, this is something like no return point. The material cannot go back. It's like free fall or like supersonic uh, motion. It just has to go ahead. And if so, then we don't have to really worry about uh, putting all this material into the central point like singularity. It's just enough that this trapped surface forms and then the subtrapped surface will finally be replaced with the horizon of a black hole. And this is all what we need for astrophysical uh, applications. We have something which looks like a black hole, which is a black hole. And that was really the, the argument which, which showed that black holes do exist and therefore they are viable uh, explanations for uh, active galactic nuclei, for, for, for quasars. So now the question is, do we acknowledge really his 95 paper according to its, its value? No, we really don't because honestly, I wrote, I don't know how many papers on, on, on active galactic nuclei, on quasars, and I, I never cited him because I assumed it's, it's kind of obvious. We have a black hole, so I start always a paper like writing in the center of the galaxy NGC, whatever, whatever, we have a supermassive black hole of the mass this and this, and that's, that's it. So final citations, they are, those papers are cited, the first uh, paper 900 times, uh, kind of summary paper a bit, a bit uh, later written over 1,000, one but in, in principle he could have 1,000 citations every, every year, but this is something which was named by Virginia Trimble the second order Mosbauer effect and citing from his her article, meaning that the folks who use Mosbauer spectroscopy in their laboratories do not generally feel the need to cite him. Well, this is what happened. Yeah, well, but uh, nobody quotes or refers to the original Schrodinger paper anymore. And there That's are clearly much more, people, much more people using Schrodinger equation than the black hole. So, yes, there yes, are, it's, there are show names. So, yes, well, yes, it's another example of this Mosbauer, second order Mosbauer effect, of course. I, I believe that because Mosbauer has never written anything more. <laughs> that is the point. He, he did enormous amount of work, but he never published any. So now to, to, to put the, his discovery in, in, in the most modern uh, perspective, does the collapse always ends up uh, mm, as a black hole, I mean a collapse of a star. No, not, not necessarily. Uh, observationally, we see, first of all, that we don't have a very low mass black, uh, black holes. The, the, the mass distribution starts from more or less five solar masses and uh, uh, small stars, smaller mass stars, they end up evolution as white dwarfs or neutron stars because uh, mm, the pressure of, of 
degenerate uh, neutrons stops uh, collapse before those trapped surfaces form. And then we have one more gap, which is not well proven, but it's rather expected. And between 100 and 250 solar masses, because uh, if we start with original 1,000 uh, mass uh, star, low mass aliquity star, and to, uh, it goes to, 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 to collapse, then at some point per instability supernova um, forms and the, 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 uh, nothing is really left from the collapsing uh, material because per instability creates enough of energy to to disperse the, the, the material. On the other hand, above this limit, um, gravity wins and we form uh, a black hole. This will be later confirmed or not confirmed by further studies of gravitational waves, which are really very efficient in, in probing the, the mass uh, spectrum of black holes. Uh, I also wanted to mention other Roger Penrose uh, key contribution to, to astrophysics. Uh, namely, he invented also Penrose process, the way to extract energy from the black hole. And the, the idea was, was proposed by Penrose and Floyd in 1971. This is in the context of uh, a rotating black hole. You cannot extract anything from rotating black hole, but if you have a Kerr black hole, then apart from the um, horizon, which is spherically symmetric, you have an ergosphere where the space-time co-rotates with the angular momentum of the, of the uh, central uh, singularity. And it was shown uh, before that uh, part of the total mass in that case consists of really irreducible mass corresponding to non-rotating uh, black hole. And the part corresponding to rotation can be in principle extracted, but the question was, can we do it in astrophysically reasonable way? And Penrose invented uh, an original mechanism Let's assume that uh, a particle decays inside an ergosphere and then uh, part falls under the horizon with, with highly negative uh, energy and then the other part with uh, positive energy escapes and this particle with positive ener energy carries away energy of a black hole and over 20% of the black hole energy can be extracted in this way if the black hole is spinning rapidly. And later this mechanism was generalized to, to scattering and now it is considered this very uh, attractive idea to solve two problems. One problem is the creation of very high energy uh, particles, so extreme energy cosmic rays, just by process in, uh, in the ergosphere of um, supermassive uh, black hole. And then, uh, based on uh, the, the second application, uh, based on the general idea of, of, of Penrose, Blandford and Znajek proposed uh, a mechanism of extraction of rotational energy, not by individual particles, but, but by large-scale magnetic fields embedded in the plasma. And this is nowadays very, very popular uh, explanation of uh, production of uh, uh, relativistic uh, jets in, in active galactic nuclei. So this blandford znajek uh, paper is now cited over 3,000 times, while the original Penrose paper only 200 times. Well, happens. 
So now I would go to the second part of the of the Nobel Prize to the achievement of uh, um, Gess and and Genser. So reading from from the announcement, the other half, John he to Reinhardt, Genser and Andrea Gess for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So those two people actually represented two independent observational programs. They, they led two teams, mostly in, in competition. The program started already in early 90s. And then and the motivation was that uh, all the people working with, with quasars at that time were using the, the phrase black hole accretion. We had models of accretion disks around black holes, et cetera, et cetera. Many evidences that the emission comes from the distance of 10 to 100 gravitational radii. But in, in other uh, communities, particularly in the physics community, this black holes were still treated as a kind of exotic, probably non-existent, whatever. So both Kess and Genzel decided to prove the existence of a black hole using not emission from the material, which is directly close to the black hole, like in quasars, but through a really conceptually simple observations of stars moving around the central black holes. Because then the argument is much, much more simple. So they aimed to proof using really pure and simple dynamical measurements that centers of galaxies contain a supermassive black hole, which is far too compact to be considered as just a compact cluster of stars. And both groups, of course, selected the center of the Milky Way, because this is the most nearby galactic center, and therefore it allows for the highest spatial resolution. And in addition, it's very, very convenient because on the one hand, Milky Way shows some activity. It was first discovered in radio, I think, in 74. So it is uh, representative for all galactic nuclei. And the, the name of this black hole region or black hole itself, it's a matter of taste, is Sagittarius A star. On the other hand, it's very weakly active, very, very weakly active. So it's not surrounded by huge accreting material, uh, which would complicate the, 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 the line of, of, of sight. So it's more easy to, 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 to study in, in separation. So the, 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 the idea was really very simple. On the other hand, technically, it was extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. First, it required uh, large telescopes because they had to resolve those stars, right? Here, it's not enough to look at the, uh, towards the, the, the center of, of, of the Milky Way, as you see here on the, on the left plot. You have really to resolve stars very close to the center. So at, at later stage, uh, Reinhard Genzel and his team used eight meter class ESO, very large telescope BLT. Uh, Andrea Guess from the beginning used 10 meter class telescope Keck. Keck one, of course, now there are two. Then next point, observations had to be performed in the near infrared because we have a lot of material uh, in the galactic plane. So therefore the, 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 field, the, 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 the line of sight is uh, uh, heavily obscured and you, in the optical band, you do not see anything in the galactic center. But in, in the in near infrared, your, field, your, your line of sight is also 
partially blocked, but still you see nothing. So you have to, to use near infrared. And then you really have to resolve this image. So here, this is the, the image of the, of the Milky Way Center from Schedel et al. This is from the Genzel group. And here, uh, notice that this is 10 arc second angular size. And you see he, here a lot of stars, also a gas, and you have to resolve that. And this is another technical difficulty because we, we need special way to perform observations. If we take just large telescope, and do a snapshot, even if we expose it for a few hours, whatever, the image resolution would be one or two arc seconds. And one or two arc seconds, if this is 10, means that everything is blurred. So at the beginning of, the, of, of their project, both groups they use something which is known as speckle photometry. Because the problem it comes from not, not from the size of the telescope, but from the motion of, of the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere. It's really turbulent. So the Earth is, is the, so the, 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 uh, the moving, uh, the motion of the atmosphere uh, makes the, the, the image blurred. The method of speckle photometry is mostly, is basically doing a very short exposures, like 0.1 second only. And then you do this exposure one after another, after another, after another. And then if you, if you do it for a bright source, you will see that the location of this source will be different at each of these images. So then you use the computer to shift images. So then the peak of the luminosity of this point like source coincide, and then you get a sharp image, re relatively sharp image. And this is a very nice illustration of, of, of the power of this technique, which I took from this website. Uh, this is for the Saturn's moon Titan. If you do ground-based observation, you do not see this, this moon basically at all. If you go to space, of course, you have sharp image, but then you have to remember that Hubble Space Telescope is a small telescope, just two meters. But if you go to 10 meters Keck Telescope and you do speckle interferometry, then you see, well, quite a decent picture of of the moon. And this is another example also from, from Keck for an active uh, galaxy where this image uh, without speckle photometry is really blurred, while here with speckle photometry you can, you can see a lot of, of detail. So that was, that had to be used at the beginning. And with that approach, a guess using a large uh, telescope Keck from the beginning was able really to get an amazing uh, picture of the galactic center. So here the, the lower part is just one arc second part of the upper limit. One arc second, something which would be totally blurred in normal approach. Here you see individual stars in a perfect way. It's fantastic, it opens a way to, to follow stars. Uh, at that time, Eckhart and Gensel were still using somewhat smaller telescope, NTT New Technology Telescope, but that was already uh, equipped with, with uh, speckle photometry and it was a test site for VLT anyway. So because of the telescope size, 3.6 meter, their image was not so uh, great as, as the Keck image. On the other hand, in 1997, they already had four years of monitoring of somewhat larger area. So they were able to measure the motion of the stars already. And why was that important already? In 1997, 
by looking at the motion and measuring this motion and then comparing the projected motion with expected central mass which caused this, this motion, they were able to determine the, the mass of the central black hole as 2.45 times 10 to 6 solar masses. And of course, precision was increasing with, with time. So using still the, the, the previous smaller instrument, in 2002, they published a very now a nice and then famous plot. Here you see the distance from Sagittarius uh, A star. And here the mass within this distance. So at large distances, you see that the enclosed mass decreases because here we have also stars, those stars also which we measure, but many other stars as well. But as we go be below 0.1 parsecs, really close to the center, where we still have a few stars here, by the way, there is S2 star, which we will talk about uh, later on, then this distribution is, is kind of flat. So then it is consistent, fully consistent with point-like mass and then the, the stellar cluster further out. And if you really insist that it's just a stellar cluster, then you would have to postulate that the stellar cluster has a space density 10 to 17 solar masses per uh, cubic parsec. Well, uh, uh, maybe you, you are not familiar with those units, but at the a distance of the sun, we have distances between stars more or less one per second. We have one, one star, so we have the density of one, one star, one solar mass per cubic parsec. At typical nuclei, nuclei uh, clusters, we have something like 10 to 6. So the density is six orders of magnitude higher, the density of stars, six. But here we have 10 orders of magnitude in excess of the, of the highest uh, reasonable density. So that was really already a very nice, nice proof of the central black hole. And the measurement was more or less consistent with the previous value 2.6. Still later on, in 2000 for, for Keck and 2003 uh, for, for uh, Genzel Group, when they moved to VLT, they started to use active optics, which is even better. So then a flexible mirror um, compensates for the variability of the atmosphere and then very nice uh, movies of the, of the motion of the stars were done. Unfortunately, those movies do not work me from inside the presentation. So I have to go outside and now, now you see it. So this, this image was really very, very popular at that time. Now we have a close-up. So the image starts at 2006, but you see here that one of the stars, this is this S2 star, which I mentioned before, almost completed the whole cycle. But this, this movie is an old movie. On the other hand, I have also movie from Americans, from Guess Group, and that is newer and full color, of course, American style. And you see it also started early. And this is S2 cloud, S2 star. So now it completed the whole circle in their data and went, went once again. And the movie is from April this year, so it's really, really fresh. OK. 
Okay, so now let's go back to presentation. So and for, I showed you those those movies. And now we will look more closely as this S2 star. As I uh, told you, it, it started to be observed by, by the Gensel group when it was quite far from Sagittarius A star, and then it performed one orbit, and then another orbit, I think now it's more or less here again. So it almost completed two, two orbits. The period is 16 years, including Schwarzschild uh, precession, which was really measured for this source quite, quite recently using uh, still newer instrument, gravity instrument on, on, on VLT. So you see that orbit is uh, highly elliptical and is fully consistent with uh, general relativity. On the other hand, you have to notice that, well, this, this orbit is, is not very close to the central black hole. At the closest distance, it approaches more or less 1,000 Schwarzschild rating. And here it's even more distant. This is the 5,000 Schwarzschild rating marker. So we do not probe really the, the, the strong gravity field here. So to put uh, all tests of uh, strong gravity field is in, in, in perspective. Mm, Dmitrios Psaltis proposed a very nice uh, diagram, which, which I like very much. It contains uh, some objects, but let's first concentrate on those two axes. So the first axis in, in, in both plots this shows the, the, the potential of, of, of the field. So let's say more or less the, the, the ratio of the, of the gravitational radius to the radius of the, of the object. And the vertical axis shows the curvature. So here you have all uh, observed black holes and uh, the curvature depends on the, on the black hole mass. So AGNs are here and Sagittarius A star is one of the smallest AGNs. So this is at the top, it starts at the top of this, of this diagram. Here you have intermediate mass black holes and, and black holes in, in, in binary systems in, 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 uh, of, of, of masses of 10, 10 solar masses. Uh, so our S2 star, I placed it on, on this diagram. It does not represent the extreme field because it's not close to the, to the black hole horizon. It also does not represent high, high curvature. And it's quite not interesting to notice that the position of the Earth is here in this point. So it is at the same location in the sense of curvature as AGNs. So the, 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 the strength of the, of the gravitational field at the uh, surface of, 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 uh, of the Earth is in, in, uh, if measured using curvature is more or less the same as, as uh, you have when you flew, uh, flow through the horizon of, of uh, black hole mass of 10 to the 8. So you would survive that comfortably. Well, the future would not be bright anyway. So because this S2 star is not quite close to the black hole, this is probably why, why the committee still was uh, quite careful saying that what Gess and Gensel did is to prove that we have some kind of dark object, whatever, whatever at the galactic center. On the other hand, what else could that be? In his review, 
In 2009, right on cancel argues that in summary, the evidence that Sagittarius A star is a massive black hole is compelling and beyond any reasonable doubt as long as general relativity holds. So he was still quite careful. On the other hand, he, he, he wants really to, 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 to probe the, the, the strong field. And this is why he is also engaged in in studying in studies which involve the distances as small as few uh, gravitational radii from uh, from the black hole uh, horizon. He's part of the of the team developing gravity instrument on VLT, and with this instrument they reach micro arc second resolution. So it's a, a bit less than event horizon telescope, but not, not much worse. You see here 100 mic, micro arc second resolution. And what they do is they observe again in the infrared and they observe individual flares, brightening flares, which likely in, in, in which exist in, in a kind of, of an accretion disk uh, uh, around the supermassive black hole, the Sagittarius A star. And as the flare develops, they, they measure the position of the flare. And always the position is consistent, roughly consistent with the circular motion around the, the central black hole. Of course, uh, again, uh, observations are complicated, but modeling now is much, much more complicated. But you, you cannot imagine that you have a cluster of, of, of stars here. No, you have really a central point like so. <clears throat> so I, I stress that uh, while in the case of Penrose, his effort was just of his own, in the case of Gensel, I guess the, the, the effort was mostly by team because it was an uh, instrumental achievement in most part. So I, I also looked uh, at the style, how they were doing this. And it was amazing how, how different it was. When I looked at most highly cited papers from Gensel group, they were not actually led by Gensel. So 1,000 citations, a paper monitoring central stellar orbits, whatever, Gillesen et al. Then this S2 star, most famous paper on that one, it's Schedel et al. Then the early paper, it's Eckhart and Gensel. Uh, on the other hand, in um, American style was, was different. The most high, highly cited papers, both late and early, were basically guess at all. Well. So if the motion of, of, of stars around Sagittarius A star does not really prove that the black hole exists, but some dark object, is it of any value for, for astrophysics? Yes, absolutely. First, it really gives the determination of the gravitational field in the center of the Milky Way, including stars. And this is now what is very important because we are really very, very much interested in evolution of the, of the, of the stars in, in the central uh, part and the dynamics of the stars is quite uh, complicated with two rings and an old uh, population and those rings are likely related to Fermi bubbles or the activity which happened a few million years ago. So it's, it's, it's really very important. It gives the, the black hole mass also very precisely and this is uh, very helpful for uh, even horizon telescope and, and gravity and the black hole mass is now determined from S2 star very accurately. As you see, it's 4.154 plus minus 0 0.013, 10 to 6 solar masses, of course. And then finally, it, it uh, provides the most accurate distance determination to the center of the Milky Way, 
with very high accuracy. And this is also important for, for many applications for cosmology because that gives us the proper reference frame and proper way to, to, to subtract the, 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 the motion of the solar system. So we are at the last slide and I would like to, 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 to share with you this uh, that should we use this term of black hole candidate or dark object or whatever. On one hand, it's always uh, good to be very careful and uh, GR may, may not be the final theory. Of course, it will not finally be the final theory because quantum effects are not included. On the other hand, uh, this complicates the discussion. So then in my papers, I would have to write every time that in the center of NGC, whatever, whatever, we have a, a, an object which more or less looks like a black hole, but we are not quite sure. Uh, then second argument, I think the Roger Penrose showed that this, those trapped surfaces is quite a generic property. So probably things like small modifications of, of GR will not change that. And then if, if going back to the, the language issues, for example, if, if we want to be careful, then we shouldn't say we detected gravitational waves, but we should say that we detected period oscillations of detector arms or whatever, which again look like gravitational wave, but might, might be something else. And then, okay, you can say that, well, you, you would have to distinguish between final proof and not quite final proof and objective and direct and whatever, but I understand that there are also ideas, uh, philosophical ideas that reality does not exist. So for example, you are just my illusion and now this illusion is really quite uh, an illusion. Maybe you, I would be tempted to stop talking. So I think it's more practical to assume that you are there and it's more practical to assume that we have black holes. Thank you for your attention.